Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Welcome to all of our guests and visitors this morning. And for those, of you, for those of you who are joining us by means of the Facebook broadcast, we welcome you. We pray that the Lord is glorified through our worship together and that you are built up and thoroughly equipped for every good work as God calls us to do in this, his world. Uh, as we come into worship this morning, I ask that you please rise as we have a responsive call to worship this morning. A bit of the Christmas story. I ask that you please read the bolded portion under congregation. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Lord God Almighty. Let us ask the Lord's blessing as we come before him this morning. Let's pray. Almighty God, as we come into your presence to worship you this morning, we pray that you would send your spirit in our midst, that we would worship you rightly in spirit and in truth, that your name would be glorified, that your people would be equipped, that we should go out from this place to preach the gospel in word and in deed. This we pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us continue worship this morning with the words of Celebration Hymnal 249, O Come All Ye Faithful. Again, the red Celebration Hymnal or also upon the screen. sisters in Jesus Christ, we lift up our eyes to the hills. From where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let us ask for his greeting this morning. Let us pray. Almighty God and heavenly Father, we ask that you greet us by the words of your servant John, where he writes to us, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Let us continue by singing the words of Good Christian Men Rejoice, found in Celebration Hymnal 273, or also upon the screen. Let us remain standing and singing Good Christian Men Rejoice.
I ask that you join me this morning in a Christmas litany, which will be upon the screen. There it is, okay. Uh, And I ask that you read the portions that are given to you to read in bold. As Christmas comes around year by year, Lord, we're tempted to say we've heard all this before. We know the story by heart. Lord, help us to see ourselves and our own attitudes lived out by people in the Christmas story. Lord, you came into an occupied country where brutal soldiers kicked people around. Lord, lots of people missed the glory when it came to Bethlehem, but unskilled laborers, the shepherds, saw it because they were at their jobs. Lord, the wise men from the east journeyed hundreds of miles and went to endless trouble to track you down. Lord, they brought you gifts of gold and frankincense. Let us respond in song, Uh, two songs, back to back, we will say uh, they will be unannounced, but in a cave and one small child, let us respond in music.
ask at this time that you please join me in prayer. Let's pray. Our almighty God, creator and sustainer of the universe, you who sent your son so long ago to be born in a manger, to be born in Bethlehem. Lord, we celebrate you today. We celebrate the greatest gift of all, the gift of your son, the gift of grace and salvation, the way that we are able to live once again in your presence, a way to no longer be sinners worthy of death with no hope living in darkness. But Lord, now that you have sent your Son, we have seen that there is light now in the darkness, that you have so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so, Lord, give us your spirit, give us your grace, that we may have faith in him, that we may be reconciled to you, that we may see your face when we have at last been justified, sanctified, and when you come again glorified. Lord, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done. And Lord, even though you have given us so great a gift and you have given us hope and life and joy and truth, we live in a world that is still so filled with darkness. And so, Lord, we pray for our world. We pray that you might use your people, your church, as instruments and tools to spread the light, to spread the gospel, the name of Jesus Christ, so that all those whom you have called to yourself may be brought in, that the harvest would be full and plentiful, that your name would be lifted high and glorified, that the name of Jesus Christ would be on every lip, for we know that at the end of, the, at the end of all things, every knee shall bow and every sh tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But Lord, we pray that while there is still time, we may bring those into the fold whom you have called. Lord, again, we pray for our world. We pray for those places that are war-torn and destitute. We think of the Ukraine. We think of Israel and Gaza. Lord, bring peace as you are the Prince of Peace. Lord, we think of places where Governments use their power for oppression and destruction, for suppression of the truth and suppression of the gospel. Lord, you are the word and you are the truth. You are the mighty God, and of the increase of your government there shall be no end. And so, Lord, we pray that you may thwart those governments that try to oppress your people, strangle the truth and subvert the church. Lord, we pray for your church. We pray for Cottage Grove Christian Reformed Church. We pray that we might be useful instruments and tools in this your neighborhood, in this your place, that we may demonstrate the light of Christ to those living in this area and all around us. We pray for our denomination. Lord, we pray for your church that you would keep her pure, that you would keep scripture, that you would keep the word at the forefront of her mind and of her message, that she would not follow the fancies of the world, be pulled to and fro by the latest idea and fad that is fancied, but rather, Lord, that we would adhere to you, that we would remain faithful and not bear false witness of the name of Christ which we wear. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us our sins, for we know that we are ungodly. We know that we are still sinners, 
in need of mercy and in need of grace. For Lord, that is why you sent your Son. And so we plead the name of Jesus Christ. We plead the blood of the cross. We plead that perfect spotless Lamb. The reason for this season. And so Lord, we pray that you would guide us, uphold us, sustain us, and keep us ever close. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, by the power and operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us continue worship by standing together to sing celebration hymnal number 292, verses 1 and 2, Thou didst leave thy throne. Again, let us rise to sing 292, stanzas 1 and 2. It will be in the red hymnal or upon the screen. I invite you to this time to turn to the scripture that we will contemplate this morning, Galatians chapter 3. We will begin at verse 23, Galatians chapter 3, beginning at verse 23. You will find it on page 1,813 of your pew Bibles. And then I will also ask you to turn in your green Psalter hymnals to the back of the book to page 77, where there... I will read Article 18 of the Belgic Confession. So again, Galatians 3, beginning at verse 23, page 1813 in your pew Bibles, and then in the back of the green Psalter hymnal, page 77, page 77 of the Belgic Confession, Article 18. Before we read God's word that we will contemplate, let us ask him to bless it to us. Let us pray. Almighty Heavenly Father, we ask that as we are to read and contemplate your word, you will be with your servant, help him to speak your truth. Be with your people. May you mold us and shape us. May you mold our hearts to follow after you. Engage our minds to hear what your word has to say. May we then be molded and shaped to follow you with our lives. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Galatians chapter 3, beginning at verse 23, and reading through chapter 4, verse 7. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we, no longer, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have, been clo- have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, 
male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as an heir, as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, he is subject to guardians and trustees until the time is set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive the full rights of sons, because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into, his, into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Thus far the reading of God's word that we will contemplate this morning. Now I invite you to turn in your Psalter hymnal to a summary of the word as we will read it in Belgic Confession, Article 18, again, page 77 in the back of the green Psalter hymnal. I will read. I ask that you please follow along. Article 18 on the incarnation of Jesus Christ. We confess, therefore, that God has fulfilled the promise which he made to the fathers by the mouth of his holy prophets. When he sent him to the world at the time appointed by him, his own only begotten and eternal son, who took upon him the form of a servant and became like unto man, Really assuming the true human nature with all its infirmities, sin accepted, being conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit, without the means of man, and did not only assume human nature as to the body, but also a true human soul, that he might be a real man. For since the soul was lost as well as the body, it was necessary that he should take both upon him to save both. Therefore, we confess, in opposition to the heresy of the Anabaptists who deny that Christ assumed human flesh of his mother, that Christ partook of the flesh and blood of the children, and that he is a fruit of the loins of David after the flesh, born of the seed of David according to the flesh, a fruit of the womb of Mary, born of a woman, a branch of David, a shoot of the root of Jesse, spring from the tribe of Judah, descended from the Jews according to the flesh of the seed of Abraham." since he took on him the seed of Abraham and was made like unto his brethren in all things, sin accepted, so that in truth he is our Emmanuel, that is to say, God with us. Thus far the reading of the Catechism. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, you might be looking at this and going, what in the world did that have to do with Christmas? Normally when you come to a Christmas service, and this was my truth as well when I was growing up, is 90% of the time we were reading Luke 2 or Matthew 1 or something like that. The birth narrative. To hear once again that glorious and blessed story of Christ coming to the earth. We read about shepherds and wonderful angels and people coming out of nowhere to, to see a babe that was born in the middle of nowhere. A, a, a royal birth in a humble stall. And yes, this sermon is about that too. Because this sermon is not merely about Paul's Galatian or about the catechism. But really, Paul doesn't get to write what he gets to write. And the catechism doesn't get to say what the catechism wants to say unless that babe was born in Bethlehem. And unless that babe was born in Bethlehem at certain times, under certain conditions, and with certain qualities, I can put it quite simply to you, there's no reason to be here then. And yet God, when it was just the right time, sent His Son, just the right person, to be born unto just the right girl with just the right earthly father to be just the right mediator and savior of us all. And as we read Galatians here, as we focus on chapter 4, verse 4 as our main theme, we see that God didn't just happenstance upon the world. 
Jesus Christ didn't say, yeah, this is about right, or yes, this is appropriate, but rather everything was meticulously planned so that Jesus Christ could set us free. That Emmanuel, God with us, could be here and could save us. And so today we will discuss this understanding of Emmanuel and what he has done for us. And those are my two major points this morning, Emmanuel and then what he has done. But our theme this morning is we serve as free children of a Savior who, ha- who was God come as man when we were slaves under law. Paul writes here to the Galatians, many years after Christ had already passed, as he had gone to his death and as he had ascended into heaven. He's no longer on the scene, at least walking around. But rather, as one untimely born, as Paul would tell the Romans, as one untimely born, he does see Christ, and Christ commissions him as an apostle, and he writes these letters and goes on these journeys. And when he writes to the Galatians here, he says, you foolish Galatians, this was earlier in chapter 3, who has bewitched you? Because the Galatians were buying into this lie of going back to the old Judaism, going back to the old law, going back to that which was constraining them to begin with. And as he continues in this whole diatribe about the difference between the law and what Christ has given to us, what he ends up doing is he's saying, don't you see what happened? Don't you see that the fulfillment of all of these things is Christ the Lord? And so you no longer have to live according to that strict law that was supposed to point to Christ, but now you have the fulfillment in and of itself. You see, you Galatians, you see brothers and sisters even this morning, Judaism was never supposed to be the end game. Judaism, even of that time, was never supposed to be the goal for the people of that time. It always pointed forward to when Christ would come. But in order for that to be made aware, you had to know who you truly were. And so God gives his law on Mount Zion. Sorry, on Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. And he gives this Ten Commandments. And those Ten Commandments, as we heard so eloquently put yesterday by Dr. Strange, it's a mirror. It shows you your true identity. It shows you God's character and you're able to compare yourself to what God's character is. And it shows you you fall short. It shows you that you are no longer a righteous, holy, amazing person, a created being in its, in its entity, but rather what it shows you is, I haven't attained to that standard. I haven't lived to that law. I'm a sinner, and I need forgiveness for that sin. But how does that come to being? In the Old Testament way, what they would do is they would take rams or goats or sheep and they would slaughter them upon an altar. And being a priest, they didn't have pastors back then, by the way. They had priests. Why? Because priesting is a bloody business. If you have a priest, a priest is the one that makes a sacrifice. And so they would cut the throats of the animals and they would sacrifice these animals and they would burn them up on the altar because the animal was a symbol of taking the sin of the person. But it never worked. It was never good enough because it was an animal. It was a sheep. It was a goat. It was a bull. It was a ram. It was merely a symbol because that was supposed to be you. That's what you deserved. That was the hellfire that you were supposed to experience because of your sin. Because of my sin. And so even in the Old Testament, 
as we see thousands upon thousands upon thousands of sacrifices made over and over and over again. Yes, according to the law and according to the prescription of God, it was never supposed to be the end. It was merely supposed to be a ritual that was supposed to point you in a direction. And what is this direction? It was supposed to point you to the fullness of time when God would send the Messiah as prophesied by the prophets of old, as prophesied over and over and over again to the Old Testament people going all the way back to Genesis where God promises even in the midst of the curses of, the, of Adam and Eve leaving of the garden, he says, but the seed of the woman will crush the seed of the serpent. That's what you're waiting for, Adam and Eve. That's what your descendants are waiting for. And as this wonderful covenant starts to grow and display itself throughout history, as we see it expounded upon through Abraham and through Moses and through David, and we start to get a clearer and clearer picture of who this Messiah is supposed to be, about who this promised one of Israel is supposed to be, we're still waiting. And so many people look at it as Messiah was supposed to be this wonderful person who was supposed to bring forth Israel as a nation and give this wonderful establishment of Israel as a nation. But they missed the entire point. Because God doesn't just want a little postage stamp in the Levant. God doesn't just want that little area between Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea. Because all of creation is His. He's the one that's spoken into being in the first place. And so the Savior that He sends, the Messiah that He sends, is not to expand the borders of Israel as a nation under a king, but rather the one who sits on David's throne eternally is the one who brings all things as a global savior, as a universal savior. That's who Christ, that's who Christ is, that's who the Messiah is. But everything leads up to him. And even those in his day missed who he was. And so in the fullness of time, at the appointed right time, exactly when it was supposed to be, God sends his son. And there are many people these days, you can go online, you can see them just about anywhere on social media, and they ask the question, we actually had this asked to us a few times, why did God choose to send his son during the Roman Empire at this time? I mean, think about it. What if God would send his son today? Why wouldn't you? Instant exposure. It could be on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, any possible platform you can think of. People could be tweeting about it. People could be posting about it. You could have videos. You could have this. Angels could pop in and we could have verifiable proof. You'd have video. You'd have digital evidence of angels that could go throughout the entire millennia as long as the world lasts. And you could say, here it is. Here it is. Here's a picture of an angel. Here's a picture of the shepherds that were brought in. Here's pictures of the wise men that came in, the magi. It's so easy then. I could see a picture. Brothers and sisters, how many people show you pictures and you go, I think that's doctored. I think that that video's been edited. I, I, I think that's not right or that's not right. How about this? How many people take a look at the words in this book? the written down verifiable evidence that's been given here and say, no, I, I, don't, I don't know. It's been authored. It's been modified. It's been shifted. It's been redacted and edited and this and that. And they try and give every excuse they possibly can to say, no, this isn't right. You think video, TikToks, Instagram, whatever you can think of, you think that would change their minds? God sent his son at that time to fulfill an exact purpose because it was the right time according to God. He sets the timetable. We don't get to. But notice here that God sends what? His son. 
And if you look in your Bibles here at chapter 4, verse 4, it says God sends His, sends his Son, capital S. He didn't send a Son. He didn't send someone. He didn't send the Mike, Steve, Harry, or whatever. He sends His Son, the second person of the Trinity. He Himself comes down. He is a divine Savior. Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer 15, tells us that he must be divine, having the nature of God, so that he is able to uphold the law in perfection. Because perfection only resides in that which is within the lawgiver. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. None has been found righteous, no, not even one. And so he must be divine. But he is also born of a woman, born under the law. He's human. He must be divine, the Son of God, in order to accomplish that which God has prescribed. But he also must be human. Why? Because the Old Testament wasn't good enough, remember? The sacrifices weren't good enough, remember? Only man can pay for man's sin, and so he must be both God and man. That's the necessity of Emmanuel. He must be both God and man. God, in order to fulfill the law, man to pay the penalty that we so justly deserve. But he was also born under the law, notice. He's not born outside the law. He's not born as one who is outside that, and it it doesn't really apply. It's not according to some predicament or circumstances in which, well, you're sort of this, but sort of not this, and so it doesn't really apply to you. No, he had the full nature of humanity upon him in both body and soul, as our catechism teaches us, so that he could truly pay for our sins and have the law applied to him as well. But why did he come? Why did the Son of God take on human flesh, born under the law to to bear that weight? Why did he do it? What does the fourth clause say there? To redeem those under the law. What's the point? Why must there be Emmanuel? Because under the law we are estranged from God. The purpose here is redemption. William Perkins puts it this way, Why was the Son made flesh? There are two special causes thereof. First, the order of divine justice requires that God's wrath should be appeased and a satisfaction made in the same nature in which His majesty was offended. That's a very long way of saying propitiation. God's God's law must be upheld totally. But secondly, the mediator between God and man must be both for nature and condition in the mean between God and man that is both God and man. He must be God in order to stand in the face of God. But he must be man in order to be a high priest that sympathizes with us. That's the necessity of Emmanuel, and that's how he's able to redeem us, to bring us together, to make atonement. By the way, did you know that atonement is a made-up word? If you break it apart, it says at-one-ment. An atoning sacrifice is one that takes two estranged parties and brings them together. It makes them one. It makes them whole. And so God's sacrifice upon the cross of his son is an atoning sacrifice that takes the estranged human race for all those believing in him and God the righteous creator of the universe and brings them together to make them one. That's why the babe was born in Bethlehem. That's why Jesus who is the Christ, who is the Messiah is brought and born And dies for you and for me. And this redemption though. 
brings around certain benefits, certain blessings, and this is the purpose behind it. This redemption was to adoption. If you just redeem something, you go to the grocery store and you bring a coupon, and it says, bring this and you get a free bottle of water, you get a free energy drink or something like that. You see them all the time in, in, at grocery stores. And you take this in, you redeem the coupon. The coupon is given over and the item is given to you. Well, what is the redemption that is made here between Christ and God? The blessing of having Christ as Emmanuel is his death stands in our place. His life also stands in our place. You see, when he redeems those who are under the law, we receive full rights as sons. Did you know that if you're a part of the church, if you bear the name of Christ, if you have faith and you believe in Jesus Christ, did you know that you're a son or a daughter of God? Did you know that you're adopted? Did you know that you're not your own, but that you belong body and soul and life and in death to your faithful Savior, Jesus Christ? How do you know, though? How do you know? You see, that's a, a, an integral question we have to ask because guess what? There are others that believe that too. But when you ask them, how do you know? Well, I believe. I do this. I do that. I, 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 I. They're instantly drawn back to what they have. But that's not the answer. Because if your redemption was based upon you, then why did Christ come? If your redemption is based upon the decision you make or the lifestyle I leave or whatever else I have to do in order to make myself right with God, what was the point of the redemption then? What was the point of the death on the cross? What was the point of the babe in Bethlehem? What's the point of the season? How do you know you're adopted? Faith is the evidence of your adoption. And so, yes, they do have an element right. I do believe. But I only believe because the grace of God was given to me so that I have belief. The grace of God given to his children is a demonstration of the promise and a guarantee of the application of the status that we have as sons and daughters of God. Erasmus puts it this way, Paul expounds how we are redeemed from the law. It happens by our adoption as children of God, which is the possession of the promised inheritance, because the inheritance follows the status of the children. How do you know you're adopted? Because of the inheritance that you have. Because of the grace that God has given you. Because of the faith that is an evidence of that grace. Because of the peace that God gives you. Because of the joy that's been demonstrated. Because of the love of God that is lived out every day in your heart. But where do all these things come from? Our text tells us quite simply here in verse 6. What is the evidence of that inheritance? What is that inheritance truly? It is the Spirit of God that lives in you. As a child, we're given the inheritance. What is it? It's God Himself. It's God with us. It's God in us. Jesus Christ said He would give us His Spirit to comfort, uplift, uphold, and sustain. And the evidence of the truth of Christmas is that the Spirit lives in us. And it's a spirit that demonstrates that we are no longer estranged, but that we are drawn near to the Father. So much so that we are able to cry out, as our text says, Abba, Father. Now, people have taken this and have kind of run with this. And, and I'm going to say one commentator I have to agree with who says, while it, was unusual to in, uh, while it was the usual intimate name used by a child to its father within the home, it's certainly over sentiment." 
sentimentalizing, if not trivializing, to translate it as daddy. That's not what's going on here. The word Abba is the Aramaic and Hebrew word for father. And the word that is translated as father in Galatians is the Greek word for father. Why? Because there is no more Jew or Greek distinction when it comes to Christ. That's why I read chapter 3 up here. It's because when you're adopted and the inheritance comes to you and the Spirit of God is within you, it's not about where you've come from or what you used to be. It's about what you are now. That same commentator continues to say, yet the use of this intimate word is to Paul the proof that we have the inner witness of the Spirit within our hearts and that in and of itself convinces us that we are children, not slaves. You don't have to be a slave to sin anymore. You don't have to cower in fear anymore. You don't have to live according to the laws anymore, praying that one day you might be able to get a taste of that salvation. It's already been accomplished for you. That was the whole point of Bethlehem. And that's the whole point of God living in you. Because... When the spirit of his son is in our hearts, it's the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Because it intercedes on our behalf. It's a spirit that says when you don't know the words or what to say or how to articulate or it knows it. It says it. It groans on our behalf with groans that we could not even comprehend because God is with us. You see, that's Paul's message here in Galatians. God is with you. That's the message of Christmas. God is with you. With you. But it's only if God has given his grace to you. Do you know? Do you wonder? Are you questioning? Are you unsure? Pray. Pray about it. Come talk to the elders in this church. Come talk to somebody in this church. If you are unsure if you are even part of the church, if you're unsure if you bear the name of Christ rightly, if you're unsure as to any of this, come, for the feast is spread. Come, because God is with us. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You see, that's the meaning of Christmas. While it's beautiful to see lights, while it's wonderful to be amongst family and friends, while it's glorious to see evergreen and snow and every trapping of the season, unless we understand that Christmas is about a babe born in Bethlehem, given as a perfect sacrifice for you and for me, that God would live with us. Then we don't really understand Christmas at all. And so brothers and sisters, Merry Christmas. May God continue to be with us even to the end of the age. Amen. Let's pray. God, our Heavenly Father, who has given us His only begotten Son, by the Spirit we pray to You. 
Lord, as words fail us, as our minds wander, as our hearts are broken and filled and anxious and worried, Lord, give us peace and comfort. Give us hope for what Christ has done that sheds His blood and washes us clean. Lord, help us to recognize that, God, You are with us. That You sent Your Son down to die on the cross and may we live every day as if that is the truth. May we live every day as if the impact of Christmas happens to us. And may we display that gospel to those around us. This we pray in the name of Emmanuel. Amen. Let us respond to our Lord with, Lord, you were rich beyond all splendor. Let us rise to sing together. It will be upon the screen. Lord, you were rich beyond all splendor. this morning is for Elam Christian Services. If you do have gifts for the kingdom of God, we ask that you please place them in the baskets in the back or on the sides here marked offering. Our closing song is Glory to God. It will be upon the screen. Let us pray for our Lord's blessing as we go upon our homeward way. Our almighty and heavenly Lord, as you are with us this morning, we ask that you would bless us as we go out into your world to preach your gospel in spirit, in truth, in word and in deed. And so, Lord, we pray that you would bless us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.